Hello, everyone, and welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum and networking platform at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. SALT Talks are a digital interview series that we started in 2020 with leading investors, creators, and thinkers. And our goal on these talks is the same as our goal at our SALT conferences, which we're excited to resume this fall in our home city of New York. But that's to provide a window into the mind of subject matter experts, as well as provide a platform for what we think are big ideas that are shaping the future. And we're very excited today to welcome Kevin T. Carter to SALT Talks. Kevin is the founder and chief investment officer of EMQQ, uh, which is a leading emerging market ETF. Uh, While he considers himself an active value investor, first and foremost, he has collaborated with Princeton economist and indexing legend, Dr. Burton Malkiel, uh, for more than 20 years. I know uh, Dr. Malkiel is also a big influence on Anthony with his great book, uh, A Random Walk Down Wall Street. Their work together began in 1999 with the development of e-investing, a pioneer firm in fractional share brokerage that was acquired by E-Trade in the year 2000. In 2002, they founded Active Index Advisors, a pioneer in so-called direct indexing, which is a trend that has taken over the wealth management world uh, in the subsequent two decades. And that was acquired by Natixis Asset Management in 2005. In 2006, their efforts turned to China and emerging markets with Dr. Malkiel's publishing of investment strategies to exploit economic growth in China and the subsequent book, From Wall Street to the Great Wall. Uh, Working with Guggenheim Partners, they launched several China-focused ETFs on the New York Stock Exchange. Kevin launched EMQQ in 2014 after noticing how the smartphone, uh, the the advent of the smartphone was changing his personal consumption habits and thus uh, his projections on how it was going to change consumer behavior in emerging markets. He now lives in Lafayette, California with his wife and three lovely children. Hosting today's talk is Anthony Scaramucci, who's the founder and managing partner of Skybridge Capital, which is a global alternative investment firm. Anthony is also the chairman of SALT. And with that, I'll turn it over to Anthony for the interview. Well, Kevin, first off, I want to thank you for getting the memo and dressing appropriately for this event. Unlike John Darcy, that's trying to outshine us with a stupid sports jacket on. So thank you for that. I want to jump right into Burton Malkiel, Dean Malkiel. Uh, and I'll just tell you a quick story, which I, I think I have shared with John. I was uh, about to be interviewed by the Goldman people. I'm at the Harvard Business School. I crossed the river. I was a Harvard Law School uh, graduate, but I'm over at the business school. And somebody handed me uh, Dr. Malkiel's book. This is 1987, A Random Walk on Wall Street. I read the entire book waiting in the waiting room prior to the interview. And I'm absolutely confident that it helped me get through that interview and get me my first job. So tell us about his influence and Warren Buffett's influence on you. Okay, well, I I didn't know the details of your experience with that book, but I did know there was some uh, overlap. So uh, I uh, graduated in uh, from college in 1991. Uh, and in January of 1992, I had... Uh, my first interview with a firm called Robertson Stevens and Company, which you may remember, um, which um, my interview lasted about 20 minutes. In the first uh, 19 minutes, we talked about college basketball. And then I got a one minute overview of the investment business. And then the guy that was interviewing me said, you can start Monday. And I said, well, how can I possibly start Monday? I don't know anything about investing. And he said, well, go buy this book and read it over the weekend. And he wrote down a random walk down Wall Street on a piece of paper. And I went I went to the bookstore and bought it and read it and showed up to work uh, on Monday. And, and as you know, it's a book that's all about efficient markets and indexing and, and one of the you know, seminal pieces in the modern investing world. And the Bert, the author, is a you know longtime Vanguard board member and, and one of the founding fathers of indexing. But I very quickly gravitated towards Omaha, and you know began to uh, began to read all the Berkshire Hathaway annual reports and anything I could read that Warren Buffett or Charlie Munger had, had uh, uh, said. And so that's you know I'm a, I'm a I pray towards Omaha, but but in 1998. I met Burton over the telephone during the dot-com bubble. And a year later, when I started my first company, I asked if he would be an advisor. And uh, he agreed. 
after I flew out to Princeton for a three hour lunch with him. And um, and so I've had one. We've been business partners in one way, shape or form since 1999. And uh, uh, so I've got one foot in the active world, one foot in the indexing world. And along the way, Burton dragged me into China and emerging markets more broadly. And this is an amazing story. Congrat- congratulations. You're, 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 you're leading an emerging market ETF, EMQQ. So tell us about that. What constitutes an emerging market? And what's the difference in groups like MSCI and, and the FTSE? Sure. Well, when we talk about emerging markets, I mean, foundationally and fundamentally, we're really talking about the world. It's 85% of the world's people. It's about 90% of the world's future as measured by younger people under the age of 30. And it, you know, it starts with China, um, but it's, uh, if you include frontier markets, which are the junior emerging markets, it's about 50 different countries with China being the largest in pretty much every measure, India, Brazil, Russia, uh, and then the frontier markets are things like uh, Nigeria, uh, and uh, other parts of uh, uh, Africa and South uh, South America. Uh, so that's that's what we're talking about. And um, you know, it's a it, the the it, there's no official list of what an emerging market is. The MSCI, you know, really created the category. It used to be called third world countries, but in a, a stroke of genius by the marketing people, they renamed third world countries emerging markets. And MSCI did that and. And so their list is, you know, really the the default standard. But there's some discrepancies in the indexing world. The the, the FTSE people, uh, which have their own index uh, and Vanguard tracks, they don't have the exact same list. So the the biggest difference there is Korea, which FTSE considers developed, and uh, MSCI does not. So if you own the the iShares version of emerging markets, you own Korea, and if you own the Vanguard version, you don't, which is a you know, meaningful difference, but not uh, a huge. If you if you were starting out today, with all the knowledge that you have of the world of investing, would you be where you are right now? And what would you recommend to a student embarking upon his career? A hundred percent ETFs, indexes, active indexes. What would your messaging be? Okay, well, that's a great question. And one I think about uh, quite a bit because um, I have a, a, a relatively young uh, a team of colleagues, and and in thinking about their four hundred one k plan, for example, I I'm forced to think about that exact question, and um, and I think that first and foremost, the miracle of compounding is the most important part of this whole thing, and whether it's buying the index. Or buying individual stocks, uh, you got to buy and hold, and buy and hold, and buy and hold, and repeat that. And uh, that would be the first thing I would I would say. And then, for those that are you know industrious and want to try to figure out how to pick the best stocks to 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 be active, uh, I would have them study moats and what a moat is uh, in. You know, business parlance in the in the Buffett and Munger uh, terminology, and and then I'd teach I'd, I'd tell them to learn about valuation and the peg ratio. Uh, you know, to me is the most important uh, thing to look at uh, if you're evaluating buying uh, equity in a company. So, moats, the peg ratio, and uh, the miracle of compounding, I think, are the things I would I would suggest they study, and I think they should also study. I suppose Bill Sharp's piece, "The Arithmetic of Active Investing," which most concisely details the mathematical fact that the Vanguard Index Fund is going to continue to beat all of the other uh, actively managed versions of investing. Um, uh, by simple basis of lower fees. Fee, fee savings is a big issue for uh, Dean Malkiel, big big issue for Mr. Buffett. Uh, one of the things Mr. Buffett has said often, and I want you to react to this, is that he's gotten his international exposure 
through American-based companies as a result of their gap accounting and him being able to understand that. You 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 guys seem to have for, forayed off the coast of America. Uh, what would you say to the xenophobic American-centric investors as to why they need to be in products like yours? Well, um, first of all, you absolutely can get exposure to emerging markets in China through U.S. companies. In fact, one of the first China strategies that Bert and I uh, organized was sort of a we, we lifted from um, from Abby Cohen, which was the uh, we called it China for chickens. So if you didn't feel uh, comfortable buying Chinese equities, you buy companies like Yum Brands, which while based in Kentucky, uh, had you know the the vast majority of its revenue coming from China, so you can you can absolutely get uh, that sort of indirect exposure. Um, uh, it you know the reality is that for the last decade plus, investors that have diversified internationally, either into um, international developed markets, the EFA countries, Europe, Australia, Japan, Canada, etc., uh, they've underperformed the S and P, and investors in emerging markets have done terrible. Uh, over the last uh, decade or even, you know, the 14 year return for the MSCI Emerging Markets Index is zero. You And you just got back to zero. You were underwater for almost all of those 14 years. So people have been disappointed by investing in emerging markets in particular. And, and I understand why, because the indexes are terrible. They, they don't really capture the growth in emerging markets. So I think investors should and can find returns internationally, but they have to get a little bit more targeted in their approach. And in emerging markets, uh, it's pretty clear to me that that's in the category of consumption. You want exposure to the growth of the consumer in emerging markets. And what we've put together is is what I think is the tip of the spear of that growth, which is the smartphone uh, enabled emerging market consumer that is getting access to the internet for the first time, getting their first computer in form of an Android-based smartphone. And 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 in many ways, uh, these people are even more digital than we are. Yeah, and, and, and I, I, it begs the question then about China and the state-owned enterprises in China. Uh, a lot of the ETFs, uh, the indexes, et cetera, uh, represent some of that. What's your opinion about allocating to state-owned enterprises? Well, I think it's a horrible idea. And, and this is why indexing is broken in emerging markets. And I, you know, I tell people the, the way I got involved with China uh, 16 years ago or 15 years ago was when uh, my partner, Bert, was asked to give a talk at Google about investing in China. I had become sort of a default investment advisor to several of the earliest Google people right after they went public in 2004. And Bert um, uh, published a paper about investing in China. And uh, the Google people found out about it and called me and said, hey, can, can Bert and come talk about investing in China? And I, I, or, I organized uh, that to happen. And Burton gave his talk about investing in China. And then all these people at Google looked at me and said, we want to invest in China. And I, at that point, I had never been to China. I read Burton's paper, but I didn't really know what that even meant to invest in China. And uh, uh, after that talk, we drove back to San Francisco and I asked our portfolio managers for a list of all the companies in the China ETF for my shares, because I assume these Google people uh, to give them exposure to China, we would just buy the ETF. And I wanted to see what was inside of it because, uh, you know, with my Omaha brand, I like to see not just what the title of the ETF is, but what are the actual companies. And before they gave me the list, Burton pulled me aside and he said, look, when you look at the China ETF, you're going to see that the vast majority of the companies are Chinese state-owned enterprises. And, you know, government owned banks and oil companies. And I said, yeah, I've heard about this and a little skeptically. And he went on to give me a, an example. And the example was you've got a Chinese manufacturing plant with 15,000 employees that's woefully inefficient and it's been losing money for a decade and it's about to run out of money again. And it goes across town to the Chinese state owned bank and says, we need more money. And where a normal banker would say, no, you can't have any more money. You're bankrupt. 
the state-owned bank is conflicted and says, well, if you run out of money, then you'll have 15,000 people out in the streets protesting, and we can't have that sort of civil unrest. And and when Bert gave me that example, I literally got nauseous inside because with my simple Omaha brain, what gives companies value is earnings, and it's the growth of those earnings that is the growth of the value. And if the people that run those companies don't care about that, why would you invest in them at all? And so this was something I encountered in the first five minutes, and it's just become more and more clear uh, about in in the case of China and the FXI, which is the ticker for that uh, product, it was about 80% state-owned enterprises. And in the broader indexes, it's about a third. And this is why you can't expect to make any money in the in the broad indexes, because these companies are, in addition to being inefficient, their, their management is um, uh, terrible. And, and there's lots of corruption. And you've got people going to jail, like the last two presidents of Brazil, uh, the former president of Korea went to jail for corruption. So state-owned enterprises are a real big problem. And they're the reason you should absolutely not use traditional approaches to emerging markets. I, you know, I, I love the sentiment. I, I totally agree with you on all of that. And I've seen you make these uh, presentations before, which I think are very important, particularly for the young people, uh, Kevin. Let's go to the iPhone for a second. Uh, it, it comes out just before uh, the Barack Obama administration. Let's call it uh, 13 or 14 years old. I still see it as an emerging technology, but it transformed your way of thinking about investing. Tell us about how it did that and how is smartphone penetration in emerging markets affecting consumer behavior? Well, I think you're absolutely right. The smartphone is a pretty new thing. And and I think we already sort of take it for granted. But I, re- I remember my first encounter with an iPhone, one of my friends who was, you know, sort of the first guy to get new stuff had an iPhone and he showed it to me and talked about apps. And I remember thinking, wow, an app. It was an abstract idea to me. Like, what what exactly is an app? And and I wasn't sure I'd ever actually be involved with apps. Um, And that was, you know, 11 or so years ago. And uh, But when I got my first uh, smartphone, my iPhone, I saw how it was changing my family's consumption. And back then, my family was going to the Target store you know, four times a week, which is only a few miles away and easy to get to. But all of a sudden, the trips to the Target store started going down and the uh, UPS man was starting to come to my house a couple times a week. And that just intensified very quickly. And pretty soon my family had stopped going to the Target store and the UPS driver and other drivers were at my house 20 times a week. So I saw, you know, you know, eight or nine years ago, how the smartphone was changing my family's consumption. And we all know this. I mean, this is, you know, this isn't really a secret. And, and you've also seen it in the stock market as the FANG stocks, the big tech stocks, the platform companies have, you know, taken over the world, basically. And, and I saw that happening in my own life. And as somebody that was trying to capture the growth of the emerging market consumer, I started to see how it was playing out in the emerging markets. And I and I could see that it was even a bigger deal in emerging markets because these people. Uh, not they weren't getting their first smartphone, they were getting their first computer ever. And it wasn't on their desk, it was in their pocket. And most of them aren't iPhones. Uh, they don't have an Apple logo because we're talking about $50, $60, $80 uh, Android-based smartphones that are bringing the computer to the world for the first time and also bringing the internet with it for the first time. So that's a very, very important uh, part of uh, what I think is the you know fastest growing sector in the world. You know, I'm the reason I'm hesitating here is I I, I, I want to frame this question uh, appropriately. Uh, Larry Summer said it to me best. Uh, he said that sometimes a advanced country is hurt by their advancement. Meaning, we built our airports in the 1920s. Uh, and then we layered upon those airports more infrastructure and airports, but our airports look like third world countries now here in the United States. And yet there are airports in Dubai and places like China that are pristine and brand new. Moreover, we started with copper wire in the in the ground or on telephone poles. And yet you can go to places in China now where they don't have any of that. It's just 
full wireless technology uh, at, at 5G switch speeds and rates. And so I want to ask you this question as an experienced investor, how disadvantaged are countries that are developed versus countries that are able to start new with the technologies that we have in the present time? Well, I mean, this is a very good and important point. And I, I have to try to think about it in real time about the advantages or disadvantages. But there's no doubt that that I guess the, the main advantage is you have new stuff and you have state of the art stuff. And certainly uh, that involves infrastructure like airports. And in the case of China, a high speed rail network, that's very, very important to that country's economic growth to connect the, the you know, well over a billion people uh, physically via high speed rail. So it's a big advantage and, and, and it's an advantage, I think, for investors in that, you know, we've seen very clearly what's happened in our lives and in our stock market with the FANG stocks, but in the developed world, the, the developing world and emerging in frontier markets, they're leapfrogging uh, lots of things. They're leapfrogging the bank account and the debit card in everybody's pocket. They're leapfrogging uh, the, the physical wires and, and, and doing, uh, you know, getting connected via mobile broadband without the telephone uh, poles. And uh, so that's a big advantage. And it's what makes the emerging market internet companies, I think, even more exciting because they're not competing with the strip malls. They're not competing with, uh, well, they're competing with the traditional banks, but they're winning quite handily. And it's sort of a paradox. You would think, you know, people like you and I that are uh, in a prosperous country and in a prosperous industry. And, you know, I'm right here in the heart, basically, of Silicon Valley. I should be on the cutting edge of things like mobile banking, but it's not us. It's Africa, uh, paradoxically, that is the most advanced in terms of mobile payments. So it's an advantage uh, for the consumers and the consumption story as they leapfrog uh, some of the legacy consumption infrastructure that we take for granted. Very, 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 very well said. I'm going to turn it over to John in a second because, you know, he did put the sports coat on, Kevin. And so as a result of which I've got to allow him to ask some of these questions. But I want to go to the mobile super apps for a second. They exist in several jurisdictions and they cover everything from e-commerce to payments to entertainment and social networking. What are some of your favorite super app investments? And then we'll let Mr. Darcy but just do me a favor. When Darcy's asking questions, don't say great question or anything like that. Okay. <laughs> let's, let's go to the super apps first and then, and then uh, we'll go to Darcy. I, your questions have been good, but I'm sure John's will be superior. He's got the code. <laughs> He's got the code. He's oh great. my God. Oh, so, it hurts me, Kevin. So, you know, the two biggest super apps in the world are basically Alibaba and Tencent uh, WeChat platform. And, uh, uh, and everybody knows Alibaba. People, I don't think, quite realize that in these two companies, these aren't really technology companies. I mean, they've been put in the technology box, but they're consumer companies and they're they're digitizing all parts of consumption. And so uh, that's e-commerce, that's uh, uh, the social networks, but it's also healthcare, it's entertainment, it's food. Uh, Alibaba's uh, Hema market is the most amazing thing I've ever seen in China. And so the, these super apps are a really big deal. And we don't really have anything like them here. And, uh, you know, we've always told people the way to think about Tencent is it's the Facebook of China. And it, that's true. WeChat is the social network. And that's how I talk to my Chinese friends and colleagues. But you can't call Facebook the Tencent of anything because... Uh, these companies don't really have a U.S. equivalent. And, and you're seeing that spread. There's a lot of super apps now. And again, these are apps that combine lots of different things that we uh, get from discrete separate apps. But Southeast Asia is where a lot of these super apps are uh, coming together. C Limited, which trades in the U.S. Uh, on the NYSE with the ticker SE, 
is probably the, the one that's done the best. I think it, it might be the single best performing stock in the world uh, over the last several years. But this is a, a Singapore listed company or based company operating all over Southeast Asia. And it's it's a mashup of gaming, of e-commerce and payments. And the, the fintech sub story in emerging markets, uh, e-commerce is the most powerful as all these people skip the bank account. And it it starts with payments. And once you get the money on the phone, then you can get into all sorts of financial services, including investment products, including insurance, and including banking and credit products. And because things like C Limited sprouted with their gaming business in a place where people didn't have bank accounts, they end up creating their own payments platform and it becomes the payments platform for these people's entire lives. So C Limited is one example. Also in Southeast Asia, you have a, a fascinating uh, company that's called GoTo, which is a merger of um, the Indonesian Uber, uh, uh, Gojek, and the Indonesian Amazon, Tokopedia. So these two companies, uh, Gojek and Tokopedia, are merging. And so you've got the Uber plus the Amazon plus the PayPal all in one single app. And uh, that's another example. And you've got all over the world, this is stories happening. And I was, you know, one of the best examples is last year when the super app of Kazakhstan, Kospi, went public in London. So the smartphone story is happening all over the world. But again, because these people and these markets lack the traditional consumption infrastructure. You're seeing these super apps come together, and it almost always involves some form of a payments uh, application and fintech. John Darcy, with your beautiful sports jacket. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to talk about China for a second, uh, Kevin, because I think you have an incredibly uh, deep understanding and nuanced understanding of what's taking place in China. Obviously, recently, the headlines have been around China's crackdown on their own technology sector, on, on Alibaba and, and Jack Ma and Ant Group, on Tencent, uh, on Didi, which uh, went public with their listing despite warnings from China about issues related to data. Uh, but Ray Dalio is somebody who I think also has, has probably a more nuanced and deeper understanding of China than, than anybody else out there in the marketplace. And, and he wrote a great piece recently about now, if you truly understand the way China thinks about capitalism and the way they're running their domestic economy, then you can actually understand the pattern of behavior in terms of how they are pushing uh, tech companies in different directions. So on, on one hand, certain people think, wow, China, all this, uh, all these crackdowns they've taken on, on Chinese tech companies makes it impossible to invest in China with any expectation of, uh, of what they're going to do with the next great tech company that comes along. But if you really understand the way they operate, maybe you can glean uh, some patterns from their behavior. Could you explain to people who are less familiar with China's thinking just about why they've made these decisions with the 10 cents, the Alibabas of the world, with DD, uh, and, and the way that can inform your investment decisions going forward as it relates to China? Sure. Well, I, uh, I follow Ray's uh, thoughts on China closely, and I'd like to think he's right, because I think they very much more eloquently expressed version of how I feel about this. And uh, you know, I guess importantly, one thing that I've experienced over the last 16 years focused on China is that people in the United States, investors that I talk to have this fear that they've had from the beginning of my China time, that the Chinese government is somehow going to essentially steal their money or otherwise cause them to lose whatever they've invested in Chinese companies. And, and some people have a more detailed fear about the VIE structure and whether or not that can be canceled. But it's just a general fear that, that somehow the Chinese government's going to make me lose all my money because they're communist and they can do that. They can take over Alibaba. They can take over uh, Tencent and Xi Jinping can make himself the CEO and steal all the money. And, and that fear has been part of my life for 16 years. And, and I think it's totally unfounded. I think the Chinese government understands capitalism. They've done it and experienced it for the last 30 years in, uh, with to the 
to their great benefit. I mean, they've benefited from capitalism more than anybody else in the world, probably for the last 30 years. And and they're smart people. And, you know, many of their leaders went to our best colleges and some of them taught at our best colleges. And I think they understand that. And I think that's, you know, when I listen to Charlie Munger or Ray talk about this, that's the one thing that I think, uh, you know, is sort of the commonality that, that these people aren't out to steal all your money. Now, uh, they do have to regulate. And that's not a China issue. This is a global issue of governments grappling with uh, with big technology. And it's on the front page of our newspapers uh, pretty much every week. And, you know, last month you had the CEO of Apple uh, in a courtroom six miles over my shoulder defending, uh, uh, you know, potential monopoly practices. You've got Google seemingly under assault from everybody and paying fines left and right of hundreds of millions and billions of dollars. So all over the world, governments are, are battling uh, to regulate a uh, technology for the benefit of their people and to make sure laws are being enforced. And that's the same thing that's happening in China, but China has one, uh, I think important difference, which I think is an advantage, but unfortunately it leads to uh, people in the United States, uh, investors in the United States, looking at it as, oh my gosh, my worst fears are coming true. The Chinese government is gonna steal all my money and make my stock worthless. And that that advantage is speed. And if you look at the way they handled the antitrust issues and the fintech rules around Alibaba, I think they did the right thing. And I think they had to do what they did. And, and uh, you know, it wasn't surprising, uh, particularly on the anti-monopoly issues, because you know, Alibaba and Tencent have blatantly done things that are anti-competitive. And you have to sort of put this in perspective, though. We've had antitrust laws in the United States for 120 years, and they've been refined a few times along the way. But China's had them for 13 years. And Alibaba and Tencent were well uh, you know, into their lives and operating before they even had regulations. So I think uh, those first two because really in this in this series of uh, crackdown, you know, the, the crackdown on the, the Chinese tech companies, it started in November with the Ant Group IPO pull and the subsequent, subsequent week they announced the anti-monopoly issues. And both of those issues got basically dealt with in April. And there's some follow up and some fines will get paid and some rules changed. But the, the speed with which they were able to address both the fintech rules and the banking part of that in particular with Alibaba. And right. the antitrust rules, they did that in five months. They basically pulled the emergency brake and did their repairs and then pushed the start button and off they went. And in the United States, that would have taken years and had lobbying and special interest groups and hearings. And so I think that the first two parts of the, the regulatory story, I thought were good and actually to me showed some of the advantages they have. What happened in July was a, sort of a debacle, and and China's got egg on its face. The regulators do, just as you know the DD management does, and the investment bankers that took them public. Um, and and I think that the biggest and most jarring part of the July uh, uh, happenings was when they basically pushed the nuclear button and and uh, turned or, or said that the for profit education from the app store. Well, they pulled Didi from the app store. That wasn't so troubling. But the canceling of the for-profit education sector, that was the first time in 16 years that this fear that people had that China is going to steal my money or otherwise I'm going to lose the value of my equity because of the Chinese government. It happened. And or at least the closest thing to it happened with, with New Oriental and the education companies. And so the panic that followed was not surprising to me, um, but I think all of it and all of the fear uh, is way overdone at this point. So why did they make that decision related to for-profit education? And there are other uh, sectors or areas that you can learn from that decision that they made uh, to avoid those types of situations in the future? Well, the reason they addressed it is because it was a real problem. And the people, it was a pain point for the people of China. The Chinese government serves the people of China. And the 
I mean, there's so many problems with what was going on there with the for-profit education. And just the, you know, the, the, the Chinese culture has revered education for thousands of years, going back to the time of Confucius. And there's a reason why our top universities are heavily populated by Chinese students uh, that have uh, gotten very good grades and test scores. It's because they study and they study in a competitive way, basically. And you've got 75% of the Chinese uh, school children are doing school after they get home from school and doing school on the weekends and extra tutoring. And, and it's expensive. And, you know, again, we've had a, uh, we have a student debt problem here and China's uh, uh, people were taking on debt to, to fund this uh, education on top of education. And um, one of the things that, that demographically that's important to understand about the, the school age children in China today is there's an incredible amount of pressure that's multi-generational on them because these children have, they have four grandparents, two sets, they have two parents, and then they are the, they're the, they're the uh, hope of the future and the embodiment of all of the dreams of all of these six people above them from the two previous generations and how they do on the college exam, the Gao Cao, is it's their whole lives and they spend years plotting it and planning for it and and testing and studying and and then they take that test and then their lives largely will be shaped by how well they do and do they get into college and it's become unhealthy and it's become with the chinese citizen a, a, a very significant pain point and that pain boiled over last year when the, the, there was a, a woman in Shandong who took the test 16 years ago, and she was actually one of two children in her family, but her, her parents, people don't, I think, always understand that in China, you can have two children even during the one child policy, but only one of them can go to school and get other social services. And this particular woman was the child of farmers, and she had an older brother, but they decided that she, Ought to get the education because she was more academically inclined. And so for years, her parents and grandparents supported her education. And she sat for the exam 16 years ago, hoping to go to Shandong Tech. And she took the test and waited for the results. And back then, if you were accepted to university, you got an acceptance letter. But if you failed the test and didn't get accepted, you didn't get a rejection letter. And she waited for her letter. And through the summer, it never came and dejected in the fall, she left and as a disappointment to her whole clan and went to the city and became a waitress. And 16 years later, she decided she should get some adult education at the functional equivalent of a community college. And when she went to register, they said, well, you've already graduated from Shandong Tech 12 years ago. And she said, no, I didn't. And they said, yes, you did. You're right here in the computer. And it turned out that she had, in fact, been accepted, but that somebody with more money had stolen her identity and stolen her acceptance letter at the post office. And she was one of hundreds of children whose lives had been basically stolen from them by people with more money. And that was a big problem. This particular right. episode really highlighted what was wrong. And, and this shouldn't have been too big a surprise. She himself in March talked about the problem in this online education uh, uh, private tutoring business. So I was surprised that they pushed the button and made them nonprofit, at least for the core curriculum. And I understand why that embodied everybody's worst fears about China. And, and that's why we had uh, the market activity. We had a couple weeks ago on Tuesday when when everybody uh, was running around with their hair on fire. So I understand the fear. In terms of damage, we have 0.05% exposure to the online education business. So it it, it crushed the, right, uh, the right. price, but the fundamentals were largely unaffected by, by really any of these uh, uh, regulatory issues. So when it comes to China, obviously in financial markets, you have to pay for growth, something we'll talk about in a second. 
But this sort of uh, these macro worries from people with a less nuanced understanding of why China is doing the things they're doing within their tech sector have made valuations certainly cheaper. Is there some type of max pain signal that you're looking at in China to potentially ramp up, uh, you know, incremental allocations to Chinese companies? Well, I mean, we buy and hold uh, all of the emerging market internet companies, and that happens to be heavily weighted towards China. Yep. And uh, in terms of the max fear point, the max pain point, I'm not sure uh, when that will be, but I think it may have been Tuesday of the week before last when when I I had never in my 28 years, other than the Lehman sort of period, which was a problem for the whole world in the real economy, I had never seen as much fear as I did on, I think, July 27th. And it was the, the morning after, the day after Stephen Roach had said he was concerned uh, as a longtime bull, he was even worried about China. And and people were running around with their hair on fire. And, and you know, even before I read a random walk down Wall Street, people told me, buy fear and sell greed. And I had never seen as much fear as I did that last week of July. And but it could get worse, I suppose. Maybe maybe Xi Jinping really does want to steal the Internet and maybe Jack Ma, you know, is missing. Um, but I don't think that's true. And so I think uh, uh, you're supposed to buy fear. And right. we still have it. Um, maybe it'll get more intense. But the 27th of July felt like uh, the most intense fear I've ever felt. Not myself, but around me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I want to go away from China a little bit around the world. India is a country that, you know, fairly soon it'll overtake China in terms of uh, the, the leader in global population, but it doesn't get nearly as much fanfare. It doesn't have nearly the weight uh, in your ETF, for example, as China does. Uh, but there are some very exciting uh, companies in India, uh, both private that are that are in sort of the IPO pipeline and public companies now. Um, what's the investment climate today in India? What's the pace of innovation? And what are some Indian companies that you're most excited about uh, investing in? Sure. Well, um, just to put it in perspective, you know, we invest in all emerging and frontier markets. China is uh, in every way the most advanced economy in the world digitally. And its e-commerce market is more than half of the globe's e-commerce market. And and that's why it's the largest weight in our uh, offering. And if if you look at it, it the Chinese e-commerce market is four times as large as every other emerging markets internet uh, uh, market combined. So it is well above everything else. Now, uh, the the next frontier of the emerging markets internet space is India. Uh, certainly the largest part of that. And that's where the growth opportunity is the greatest. Um, and they're come, but it'll never catch China. China is so far ahead that the, it, the, certainly not in my lifetime will India catch China, but the growth rate there will be uh, the highest. And there's a huge pipeline of Indian IPOs and they're coming fast. We had Zomato, the food delivery app come public last week. We've got Paytm, which is the Berkshire Hathaway backed uh, fintech leader in India getting ready to come public. We've got Flipkart, uh, which Walmart controls. That's the, the largest e-commerce company in India. It will come public. And then uh, perhaps next year we'll have Reliance Industries IPO, their geo digital super app business, which I think uh, if I was going to bet that will be the dominant super app in India. So India has got a ton of opportunity. It's got a lot of companies coming public and and the next 18 months could see as many as uh, 15 or 20 Indian internet companies come public. And people should be excited about it because it's it's coming off of a very low base with a large population. You still have 900 million people in India that don't have a smartphone, which means you have 900 million people without a computer or the internet, but that's changing very fast. Right. Let's go to Latin America for a second. So you talked about a company like Mercado Libre that's been on fire over the last several years in Latin America, you know, different characteristics than places like Southeast Asia or a place like India. What is the, the climate there right now uh, for investing, and particularly in technology, which is an area that you're keenly focused on? And, and what does the IPO pipeline uh, look like in Latin America? 
Well, it, it looks good. And, you know, Latin America's e-commerce penetration rates are a fraction of Asia's. And uh, Mercado Libre is is the leader. And it's Mercado Libre, technically it's an Argentinian company. So on fact sheets and other things, you'll see Argentina listed. But it really dominates both e-commerce and payments in every country from Mexico uh, all the way down through Argentina, with Brazil being the largest market, uh, followed by Mexico. And and it, uh, in particular, was a great example of the fintech story. And it's what really, you know, drove the stock's incredible returns over the last several years was the strength of their fintech business. And, and it's also a company that's a good example of another problem with traditional indexing. Mercado Libre is not in the Vanguard or iShares Emerging Market Fund, and, and about half of these companies are not included. So you get, if you buy a, the traditional approach to uh, indexing in emerging markets, you get Petrobras, the Brazilian uh, corrupt oil company, twice, but you don't get the Brazilian e-commerce leader, Mercado Libre. So that's that's the biggest of the companies, but you've got you've got Uruguay has a public company now, D-Local, that uh, we'll add in our next rebalance. You've got the world's biggest online bank in Brazil, New Bank, which will come public uh, likely in the next year. They just raised $500 million from my heroes in Omaha, Berkshire Hathaway. And that's uh, an online-only bank that now is half the size account-wise as Wells Fargo. And Berkshire Hathaway is also an investor in Stone Co., which is a NASDAQ listed uh, fintech company out of Brazil. So there's there's a lot of entrepreneurs in, in that part of the world and the US institutional investors are backing them, including uh, as mentioned more Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, so lots going on there. And, and I guess the other thing I'd say when we talk about South America and you know, having just talked about China and the China regulatory risk, Everything's relative in the world. And you say, OK, well, I, I don't trust the Chinese government. So, OK, well, what, what else do we have in emerging markets? You've got Putin in Russia. You've got the last two presidents of Brazil went to prison for basically stealing your money if you're investing in the broad indexes. So, you know, everything's relative in the world. And these these other regions have political risk as well. And they'll also have regulatory risk. But China just happens to be a bit more advanced in all things. Right. Um, switching gears a little bit, I talked about, you know, sort of a core tenet of, of investing is that you have to pay for growth, you know, things like PE ratios. And, and I know you look at something like the PEG ratio, which is looking at price to earnings in the context of growth rate. But you talked about how China's e-commerce and, and sort of internet based economy is much more robust than it is in places like India or Latin America or, or elsewhere in emerging markets. How expensive is the growth that you're paying for generally in emerging markets right now relative to what you're seeing in the U.S. or developed markets? And, and in which markets uh, are you able to most inexpensively access uh, what you deem to be really exciting growth? Well, I, I think you're absolutely right. The only ratio I care about is the P.E. versus the growth rate. And I like to use the revenue growth rate for a couple of reasons. A, it's your purest form of growth. You can grow earnings with declining revenue by share buybacks and so forth. So, and also you have, you know, a, a, what's now widely accepted model, which is to get big and not worry about profits until you're really, really big, a la Amazon. So I looked at the, the PE over the revenue growth and the valuations right now, uh, this particular group of companies, you know, the EMQQ, uh, index has a peg ratio of about 0 0.68, 0 0.69. And that's half the peg ratio of the US tech leaders. And it's about a third the peg ratio of the S&P 500. And so uh, after this big decline, I, I'm pounding the table. I think valuations are very reasonable. The Chinese part of that story, which is the you know, largest part, is the cheapest right now for obvious reason, the fear has led to very, I think, attractive multiples. So I think that uh, China is probably the cheapest part right now, but the the, the non-China part, you know, the next frontier, which is the 35% that's India, Brazil, Nigeria, et cetera, uh, its peg ratio is about one, its growth rate's higher, 
Um, but the peg ratios are, I think, quite attractive. And I, you know, when I launched this uh, EMQQ seven years ago, I did it when a friend of mine asked me what was the best uh, emerging markets ETF for her daughter's college fund. So if, if a three-year-old's, you know, 15-year time horizon. And I thought, based on the, the valuations, that this sector was the best uh uh, way to get that exposure. And even after our big decline, we're still number one by a decent amount out of everybody in the emerging markets. And right now with valuations, I think that we'll be in the same place five years from now because the peg ratio is very attractive. Uh, and uh, I think that the valuations will take a permanent hit from the current, you know, recent debacle. Enough people will run away and not come back. But, you know, in in the short term, as we say in Omaha, the market's a voting machine, but in the long term, it's a scale. And what goes on the scale is the cash in the cash register at the end of the day. Amen. Well, that's a good place for us to finish. Again, thank you for coming on. Kevin T. Carter of EMQQ. Again, it's the number one emerging markets ETF over both a three and five year time horizon out of, uh, I believe, around 57 funds over the, the shorter time frame, about 46 uh, that have been around over a five-year time frame focused on innovation, internet, and e-commerce primarily. Again, EMQQ. Kevin, thanks so much for joining us. Anthony, you have a final word for Kevin before we let him go? No, listen, I, I only wish I had met Kevin 20 years ago. <laughs> I wanted to be in the room where it happened in the meeting with him and Dean Malchio putting this thing together. So congratulations to you, Kevin. And I'm looking forward to the next 20 years. I'm uh, I'm hoping that we can do a lot of fun things together. I uh, share your sentiments. Lovely to meet you guys both. And Kevin, we're also excited to have you at our in-person SALT conference this fall, which we're looking forward to you uh, giving this presentation to our community in person, which we're, we're, we're thrilled to be bringing those events back. So look forward to seeing you then. And thank you everybody who is both attending SALT this fall and everybody who tuned into this SALT talk. Uh, just a reminder, if you missed any part of this episode, you can access an on-demand on our website at salt.org backslash talks and on our YouTube channel, which is called Salt Tube. Uh, we're also on social media. Uh, Twitter is where we're most active at Salt Conference, but we're also on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook as well, streaming some of these episodes there. Um, please spread the word about these Salt Talks. We think, especially with the recent drawdown that we've seen in China and emerging markets, you know, we don't give investment recommendations, but it's certainly a compelling time to, to look at uh, continuing to diversify your portfolio. And as Kevin mentioned, some of the valuations uh, in emerging markets in terms of what you're paying for growth uh, are particularly attractive right now. But on behalf of Anthony and the entire SALT team, this is John Darcy signing off from SALT Talks for today. We hope to see you back here again soon.